Hello and welcome to this Bible study today. We're going to be doing the last lesson in our series, The Christian Living in Today's Environment. And our last lesson is entitled, The Christian Living in Any Environment. Let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you that you sent your Son into this world to make us right with you because we know that our sins only deserve punishment and that Jesus makes us right with you, God our Father, so that we can live forever with you in heaven. But we also know that while we live here on this earth, there is going to be difficulties and trials. And you give us the ability to endure through those, through the power of your word and by your grace. Help us to understand that from time to time you allow things to happen for our good. Please direct us to your word to find answers to our concerns and questions. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. So the lesson that we have is entitled, The Christian Living in Any Environment. And just a reminder that if you want a little bit of time to be able to look up a Bible passage, uh, just pause the video so you'll have time to look up the passage in your Bible if you'd like to read along. Isn't it wonderful knowing that once we become children of God, we begin to live in a utopian world where there is no more pain, disappointment, or suffering, or an adversity. If you have ever heard those words spoken by a leader in the church, then you're hearing a message that is not exactly true. It's almost spreading a false message or even a false gospel because Jesus made it clear to his disciples and to us that living in the world that we live in there will not be utopia and peace there will be pain disappointment and suffering listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 16 verse 33 I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We all know this, and it is true that sin, the sin in this world, brings the bad things that we have to deal with. And we Christians are not immune to them. But we need to take heart because our Savior understands what we're going through. And he tells us that he has overcome sin in this world. And we've seen it in the lessons that we've covered so far up until this point. But we continue to realize this, that there are all kinds of adversities that we have to deal with in this life. Family lives are crumbling. Education is becoming a tool of Satan. Technology has brought so many new problems into the Christian's life. And the world, the world that we live in seems to be becoming more hostile to God's people. But there is good news in all of this. The good news is that no matter what pressure we face, no matter what problem we face, there's always the assurance that God is in complete control. Let me say that again. No matter what pressures we face, no matter what problems come into our lives, we always have this assurance that God is in control. 
from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. The writer says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. It is the Lord's purpose that prevails. A question for us to think about. One of the main questions that many unbelievers have is this. How can a loving God allow bad things to happen? How can a loving God allow bad things to happen? And what would we say to them? This passage speaks to it. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And the Lord's purpose is this, that he wants all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And when bad things happen, it's because there is still sin in this world. And the only way that God can deal with sin is through his Son, our Savior. And sin will continue in this world, and there will be problems in this world until Jesus comes again. But God wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, he has not finished his plan of salvation yet, and Jesus has not come again. Why do bad things happen? Because God wants you and me. He wants us to be saved. And if he would have said there in the garden with Adam and Eve, no, everything's over, we're going to start again, then you and I would not be here and be a part of God's family. Our next section of this study is called A Great Cloud of Witnesses. Those who have gone through trials and difficulties, those who have been recorded for us in Scripture. Throughout history, we know that Christians have faced many trials and dealt with all kinds of adversity. There have been oppressive governments, hatred, ridicule, torture, illness, loneliness, tragedy of every kind that have touched all of God's people throughout history. And yet, this should come as no surprise to us, especially when we read what God has to say to us in his word. From 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And then again in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, Paul writes, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. The good news is this, that God does not leave his people to suffer alone. Rather, he teaches us to deal with every situation that comes our way, and he promises us a way to get through it. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. This is where Paul speaks to us about how we can be tempted to despair when things come our way that are beyond our control. And he says this, No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 
people have faced many difficulties. And there's a chapter in the Bible that speaks about people in the Old Testament who went through many difficult trials and adversities in their lives as believers. This is in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. It's often called the chapter that talks about heroes of faith. Heroes of faith. And near the end of chapter 11, listen to what the writer says about those who have gone through some very difficult things. He says that some faced jeers and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Then the writer says this about them. These were all commended for their faith. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. You see, these people were living in the Old Testament, waiting for the promise of the Messiah to come, and yet they had not seen the coming of the baby Jesus there in the manger in Bethlehem, like we know and have seen through the eyes of Scripture. And yet, they were commended for their faith. And since God had planned something better for us, also, together with them, we will be made perfect. A wonderful, wonderful thing. Everything that was written in the Bible was written to teach us. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the very next verse after chapter 11 says this, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. This great cloud cloud of witnesses that he just talked about in the Old Testament, those who lived a life of faith, many of them mentioned, such as Abel, Noah, Abraham, and the list goes on and on and on. We have Rahab, we have Samson, all of these Old Testament heroes of faith, David and Samuel and the prophets, those mentioned in, in chapter 11 is who the writer to the Hebrews is talking about. And now he's encouraging us to throw off that sin that so easily entangles, and that sin is this, the sin of doubt. The sin of doubt. To doubt that God is really in control. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Paul assures us of this. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Hope. That's how we deal with adversity. There's a question near the end of page one. Why do some Christians seem to suffer more adversity than others? Some seem to suffer more than others. But let's all remember this. 
that God never gives us more than we can handle. And he knows how much we can handle. And then he will always provide a way out, as we heard in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Our next section is called Adversity and God's People. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we hear this, a very comforting verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. God works everything for our good. And Paul says all things, everything, will work out for our good. And that is for us to be with the Lord forever. So Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, something very interesting. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. We don't lose heart. Why? Because even though we are wasting away, yet inwardly we can be renewed day by day through the power of God's word and his sacraments. And then he says that our, our troubles are light and momentary. They may not seem light and momentary when they're happening, but that's the picture that Paul gives to us. They're just light and momentary. They're not beyond what we're able to endure. Does any adversity happen in our lives of which God is not aware? No. God is aware of everything that happens in our lives. And he uses all of it for his good purpose, to work all things for our good. Now, adversity is meant also to teach us, to teach us some things. The first thing that adversity teaches us is that we are sinful and that we are weak. Let's listen to what this part of the lesson has to say to us. The Old Testament has the book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah was a leader who God sent to help the people of Jerusalem rebuild. Nehemiah had been in captivity in Babylon, and the king there, Artaxerxes, told Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city, to rebuild the capital. And it was a difficult task. And one of the main things that had to be done was to rebuild the wall that surrounded Jerusalem for their protection and to rebuild the temple. It was a monumental task. And there were enemies yet in the area still attacking those who had returned to Jerusalem from captivity. And when Nehemiah realized just how hard the job was for him to do, it's recorded that he prayed. He prayed, now strengthen my hands. You know, when we're at the, our weakest moment, that's when we have to remember that God is our strength. God is the one who can give us the ability to endure. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says this, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It's God who gives us the strength we need to endure and to overcome. We must never, ever underestimate God's power and strength. Too often, we rely only on our own ability, our own power, and we forget about God. 
This was evident when God told Moses to feed his people meat in the wilderness. Moses, Moses told God, even if he slaughtered all the animals that he had, he couldn't accomplish the task to feed all the people meat. And then the Lord reminded Moses of his power and his strength. And he said, is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. God's arm is never too short. And we know that God sent quail into the camp. And there was so much quail that it said it covered the entire camp up to the knees of the people standing there. And they had more than enough meat to eat. What do you think Paul meant when he wrote, For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. When we stop relying on our own strength, knowing that we are weak because of our own sin. That's when God comes with his power, working through the power of his word and the Holy Spirit living in our hearts where we can have the strength and be strong. The next part of our study says that adversity will get our attention. Sometimes we need that. Sometimes like a two by four upside the head. How would you react to these words? Get your house in order. You are going to die. You will not recover. How would you react if someone would say that to you? Well, these are the exact words that the prophet Isaiah spoke to King Hezekiah in Isaiah chapter 38, verse 1. King Hezekiah was one of the few faithful kings of Judah after King David. And during his reign, he, he destroyed the pagan temples and the idols, and he reached out to the people so that they would repent and follow the true God. And now at age 40, Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and told him that he was going to die. How did he react to this news? Isaiah 38 Continues with these words, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And then Hezekiah wept bitterly. The tears that filled his eyes were tears of regret, knowing his own sinfulness and knowing that he deserved to die, but he asked God to spare his life. You know, sometimes God allows adversity to come into our lives to get our attention. It certainly worked with Hezekiah. And sometimes God allows terrible things, trials and difficulties to come into our lives to take us out of our comfort zone so that we turn to him when we are facing these trials. Some moments can cause us to stop and really look at what's important in our lives. And those are the times when we need to go to God to repent and to ask for his guidance and his strength and his power to be able to overcome the adversity that's in our lives. As I close this study for us today, I'd like you to think about the different times when adversity has come into your life and how God may have used that to wake you up. We'll continue our next Bible study and finish this lesson looking at other examples of how God uses adversity to bring us closer to him. We'll close this part of the Bible study with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, it seems a strange prayer of thanks to thank you for the adversity that comes into our lives. But 
we can thank you because through those difficulties, you can teach us to trust in you. Help us to always see your will in everything that happens in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next time, God bless you and keep you safe. Thank you.